Your modern KJV is not even the same as a 1611 KJV. It's just a pawn in the hands of the church. If you're a Christian, I can guarantee that you've heard that Daniel chapter 9 has a precise calculation of exactly when the Messiah is supposed to die. And of course, this correlates with Jesus' death. Now, I want to ask you a question. If this is true, why did Paul never write about it? Why did Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, why is there no mention of it inside of the New Testament? I would posit to you that it's a later invention of the church. Now, hear me out. Daniel chapter 9 is a really complex chapter. It involves a lot of mathematical calculations using non-conventional units of measure. It speaks in weeks of years. What does that mean? It means that every day of the week is actually one year. So seven days or a full week equals seven years. Moreover, there's just so much going on and you have to know different biblical references in order to really get the full picture. And most Christians have never had the chance to go back, study in depth, learn it inside and test this claim. So I'm going to expose to you three ways the church lies to you about Daniel chapter nine. In order to do this, we're going to have to go back and we're going to have to get an overview of what Daniel chapter 9 actually speaks about starting from the very beginning. So bear with me. We're going to go back. We're going to do some history. And then we're going to move into our lie exposures. The first verse of Daniel chapter 9 opens up with Daniel saying that he's standing in the first year of Darius the Mede. Now we have to ask the question, why is this important? And of course, who is Darius the Mede? So a little history, Darius the Mede is the king that overthrew the Babylonian empire. He's the one that knocked it all down and set up the beginning of the Media Persian empire. He's a really important character. And Daniel is standing at this unique period in time when he just watched the entire Babylonian empire fall and there's a new empire coming into being. And verse two tells us that he's contemplating the calculations of Jeremiah at this period in time. What does that mean? Why is Jeremiah important? Why does it come into view? And then we see that in verse three, he puts on sackcloth and he starts fasting and he's praying. And then from verse four through verse 20, he's pouring out his heart in prayer. He's admitting to God that we have sinned against you and God, please have compassion upon us and take us back to Jerusalem. Have mercy on your holy mountain. And he's just opening up his heart and he's admitting the sin of the Jewish people. He's terrified. He's tormented. He's traumatized. He's in pain. Why? Because here's the thing. You see, in Jeremiah, there are two prophecies that employ similar language. They sound very similar. One of them is in Jeremiah chapter 25, which speaks about the subjugation of the nations under the Babylonian empire and the subsequent fall of the Babylonian empire. The other prophecy is in Jeremiah chapter 29, which speaks about the return of the Jewish people from Babylon after a 70 year period. So when Daniel, not having the benefit of the book of Daniel, is reading Jeremiah's prophecies, what's really happening is he's conflating these two prophecies. He's believing that they're the same prophecy. These 70 year periods are actually taking place at the same time. And that when the Babylonian empire falls, the Jewish people are supposed to be returned en masse to their land. And here's the thing, he's standing in the first year of Darius the Mede after he's already watched the Babylonian empire fall. And guess what? The Jewish people are still not returned to their land. So he's thinking, oh my gosh, it must be that we did not repent. It must be that we activated the curse of Leviticus 26 and we've either extended or even canceled our return to the land of Israel because the Babylonian empire fell, but we're still here. So he's crying and he's pouring out his heart to God and his prayer is very beloved. And God dispatches the angel Gabriel who appears in verses 21 and 22. And in verse 23, Gabriel tells him, listen up, understand what I'm about to tell you. And then from verse 24 to 27, Gabriel explains to him that these are two different 70 year periods. The first of the 70 year prophecies had already been fulfilled with the downfall of the Babylonian empire, but the second one was still in the middle of unfolding. Now, very important to note is that after Daniel had received this information from Gabriel, he went back and he wrote Daniel chapter nine, and he made sure you know when you're supposed to start counting the second 70 year period. In verse two, he tells us it begins from the destruction of the first temple. So Daniel is standing in the second 70 year time period and Gabriel explains to him what is going to happen in the coming years. 70 weeks have been decreed upon your people and upon your holy city to terminate transgression, to end sin, to wipe away iniquity, to bring everlasting righteousness, to confirm the visions and the prophet 
and to anoint the Holy of Holies. Gabriel explains to Daniel that this 70 week period or 490 years is going to be divided up into different blocks of time. And of course the unit of measure is seven years or one week in this non-conventional language. So he tells him, he says, the first period of time is going to be a seven week or 49 years in conventional language period, after which is going to come a 62 week period or 434 years. Now, let's do the math here. Just want to point out that the calculation seems to be a little bit off. He mentions two different blocks of times, seven weeks and 62 weeks. Now, I don't do math very well, but seven plus 62 equals 69. So it seems that we're missing a week of years or in conventional language, 49 years plus 434 years equals 483 years. Like where is that remaining seven years? Put that in the back of your mind, that remaining week or that remaining seven year period is going to come into view a little bit later. For now, let's talk about what happens during these two blocks of times, the seven weeks slash 49 years and the 62 weeks slash 434 years. What's going on there? So Gabriel explains to Daniel that after the seven week period or the 49 years, then there's going to emerge somebody called a Mashiach Nugget. After this period, there's going to be 62 week period. And after the 62 week period, then there's going to be a Mashiach who is cut off. Now, this word Mashiach is commonly translated here in Daniel chapter nine in Christian Bibles as Messiah. The word Mashiach in Hebrew simply means anointed. And this word is used most commonly inside of the book of Leviticus to refer to the priesthood. It's also used to refer to kings and to prophets. The one thing it never refers to is the Messiah inside of the Hebrew Bible. It's used 39 times and it's never used in that application. Now, Mashiach Nugget means an anointed leader, somebody in a political position, somebody in a position in which the world is looking up to them. They're controlling an aspect of society, okay? So we have to ask the question, who is the Mashiach Nugget of this verse? Who is this person that comes along after seven weeks and initiates something happening? What is that something happening? The rebuilding of Jerusalem. That's what the verse tells us. After the seven week period, there's going to come a rebuilding of Jerusalem. And then for 62 weeks, Jerusalem is going to be re rebuilt, street and moat, but in troubled times. So the question is, can the Bible provide us this context? And of course, the answer is yes, you just have to know where to look. So there are two places that you can look in order to get this information. The first one is just flip over to the book of Ezra. We're going to see that somebody arises after Darius the Mede. His name is Cyrus, and he issues a command that the Jewish people can go back and rebuild Jerusalem and the Holy Temple. Now, the question is, is was he ever called a Mashiach? Yes. Go over to Isaiah chapter 44, verse 28, and Isaiah chapter 45, verse 1, who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and all my desire he shall fulfill to save Jerusalem. It shall be built and the temple shall be founded. So said the Lord to his anointed one, to Cyrus. Now that word used there is Mashiach, Limshichai, to his anointed one. God is calling Cyrus his Mashiach. The Mashiach nugget here, the anointed leader who allows the Jews to go back and rebuild Jerusalem being referred to in this first period that emerges after the seven weeks, that's Cyrus. So now we can go on and we can explore the next part of the verse. The verse tells us that after 62 weeks there's going to be a Mashiach who is cut off. Who is that? Well, let's ask the question. Can the text provide us with context? Can we begin to understand it by examining the text? And yes, let's just read further. We learned that during this 490 year period, in the part where the Jerusalem is rebuilt, street and mount, but in troubled times, there's going to come another week. That week is referenced in verse 27. And what is going on in verse 27? Well, we see that there's going to be an army that comes along and that army is going to attack Jerusalem. Now, not only is that army going to attack Jerusalem, but they're going to have a covenant made with the Jewish people and they're going to break their covenant three and a half years or a half a week before the end of this 490 year period, which finishes with the destruction of the second temple. Now let's put things into context. What happened three and a half years before the temple was destroyed? The war with Rome began in 66. The sacrificial service was cut off. And if we read verse 27, we see that's exactly what it's referencing. 
He will forge a strong covenant with the great ones for a week, but for half of that week, he will abolish sacrificial offering and meal offering. All right, that's what we're focusing on right now. Now, we see that the sacrificial offerings are going to be cut off. Now, let's go back and ask the question. Okay, so we are dealing with a Mashiach that is going to be functioning up until the 62 week period, after which there's going to come a period of time in which they are cut off. Now, what does the word Mashiach mean? We spoke about this already. The word Mashiach simply means anointed, and it's most commonly used to refer to the priesthood. This is exactly what is going on here. You see, we found our missing week. This week is separated because the Mashiach of this verse becomes cut off from his duties. The priesthood is the Mashiach of this verse. It's the anointed priesthood. But the priesthood can't be fulfilling his activities anymore. He can't be fulfilling his holy duties inside of the holy temple because he's no longer allowed to operate the sacrificial system. So we have two Mashiachs that come into view in these passages. There's the Mashiach Nugget, the anointed leader who is Cyrus, and we have the second Mashiach who is the priesthood who is cut off from performing the sacrificial duties inside the Holy Temple. All right, I hope that was clear. It's a little bit complicated, just a lot of moving parts. Now that you have this background information, we can begin exposing the crimes of the church. Are you ready? Crime number one, intentional mistranslations. So we spoke about this word Mashiach meaning anointed, very simply meaning anointed. And I'm going to give credit to the Christian Bibles. There are places where this word is correctly translated, such as in Isaiah chapter 45, verse one, where it speaks about Cyrus. This word Mashiach is translated as anointed, right? Only over here in Daniel chapter nine, all of a sudden that word is going to be not only Messiah, but some Christian Bibles are going to translate as the Messiah, the Prince, in order to give it a Christological feel to make you believe in Jesus. Now, I wanna ask you the question. If, if this word can truly be translated as Messiah or the Messiah with a definite article, which doesn't appear inside of the Hebrew text, then why are Christian Bibles not translating Isaiah 45 verse one, which refers to Cyrus as the Messiah? Why is Cyrus not being called the Messiah with capital letters? And you see, that's another problem. There are no capital letters in the Hebrew language. So when your Christian Bibles are going and saying the Messiah, the Prince, that is completely bogus. It's totally made up and it does not reflect the text. Are you ready for lie number two? Some Bibles, such as the modern KJV, tried to compress the seven-week period and the 62-week period into one time span. They do this because they want to conceal the fact that there are two Mashiachs mentioned here. They want you to think it's one Mashiach and one time span. So they go beyond the capitalization and the Messiah with a definite article, and they actually scooch these time periods together. You see, in Hebrew, it's very clear that these are two separate weeks. And in fact, there's actually grammatical notation in the Hebrew called an asnachta that's underneath the seven week period that indicates a full stop, a separation, two different ideas between the first and the second half of the verse. And what's really interesting is you'll notice that I said the modern KJV. Why did I choose that word? It was intentional. You see, the 1611 KJV did not engage in this practice. It's not because they were God-fearing people, because they corrupted the Hebrew Bible in so many other ways. They just simply didn't think of it. It's a later invention. Let's examine the 1611 KJV and the modern KJV. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto, unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks, semicolon, and three score and two weeks. Okay, so the original KJV stayed true to the Esnachta. They put a semicolon there. They separated these two different time periods. Let's look now at the modern KJV. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. What happened to that semicolon? What happened to our Esnachta? What happened to our full stop? All of a sudden it disappears and it becomes like this fancy language, seven and three score in two weeks, right? I mean, come on, nobody speaks like that, right? They are trying to make you think it's a one-time period. There are not two different Mashiachs. Are you ready for crime number three? We know that we're speaking about a 490 year prophecy that begins with the destruction of the first temple in Jerusalem and it ends with the destruction of the second temple in Jerusalem. Now, 
let's just pretend that theoretically this passage does refer to a Messiah dying. Let's just give a free pass on this one. Let's pretend that Mashiach actually means the Messiah, as they want you to believe. And let's just believe that Yakaris Mashiach, which means a Mashiach will be cut off, does not refer to the priesthood, but actually refers to death. Now, the term Ikare simply means to cut off. It does not mean to die, but whatever. We're going to give a free pass on this one. So a 490-year period that ends with the destruction of the Second Temple. Let's simply ask the question, when did Jesus die? According to Christian calculations, he died in the year 30 or somewhere around there. Now, 30 is 40 years before the destruction of the temple in 70. That's a huge amount of difference. It's a 490-year prophecy. So where are those 40 years or those 5.5 weeks in non-conventional language? The calculations don't work. It's a scam. All of this is just to make you believe in Jesus, but it doesn't work. It falls apart. When you examine the Hebrew, when you examine the calculations, it doesn't fit. And then you see the crimes of the church about the modern KJV and some other Bibles trying to compress these time periods. Now, this point about the compression of time period should hit really hard for those people who believe that only the KJV is the inspired word of God. I mean, stop and think about it. Your modern KJV is not even the same as a 1611 KJV. It's just a pawn in the hands of the church, and so are you. Here's the thing. You have been lied to. And the reason that the Jewish people don't believe in Jesus, that he's the Messiah, is not because we're blind, because there are veils and scales over our eyes. It's not because we're the seed of the devil. It's because we read the Bible in its original language. It's because we love God and we hold true to his word. We hold it tight and we're not willing to deal with somebody playing around with our Bible to corrupt it. We love God and we want every human being to be in a relationship with God. Whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, you can have a connection with God. He has certain obligations for each of us that are like hugging and kissing Hashem, ways of coming close to him. And we want you to be in that relationship. It doesn't involve any intermediaries. It doesn't involve any blood drinking, any human sacrifice. All of that is an abomination. The core of Christianity is opposed by the Hebrew Bible. And when you go back and you examine the text, you will see that every single alleged prophecy that Jesus fulfilled is either a mistranslation intentionally on behalf of the church, a text that has been ripped out of context, or some other bogus claim that doesn't even exist. You have been lied to, and it's time to repent of idolatry, to come home and to serve only the God of Israel. He loves you, and he's waiting for you to return to him.